Actually, it's a very auspicious and very, very sacred day the appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Lord Balaram. Before we can understand Leela, we have to understand Tattva. Tattva is the foundation to, for the understanding of Leela. And therefore, Tattva is presented first within the Shastra. Tattva means the philosophical principles that are the understanding of the subject matter that we're speaking about. So here we're speaking about the Supreme Personality of Godhead. What is his position? And what, why does he appear in this world? And what is our relationship with him? And most important, how to increase and you know, develop that relationship with him. So here, the next verse says, there are two, these two, that is Krishna and Balaram, are one and the same identity. They differ only in form. Lord Balaram is the first bodily expansion of Krishna, and he assists in Lord Krishna's transcendental pastimes. So there's a small purport. Balaram is a swamsa expansion of the Lord, and there, therefore there is no difference in potency between Krishna and Balaram. The only difference is their bodily structure. As the first expansion of Godhead, Balaram is the chief deity among the first quadruple forms. And he is the foremost assistant, this is important, he's the foremost assistant of Krishna in his transcendental activities. And Balaram assists Krishna in his activities. He is sometimes referred to as Godhead who is in the mood of service. And Krishna is in Godhead who is in the mood of accepting service. Both are Godhead but both play slightly different functions in relationship to the principle of the absolute truth. hope that makes sense. So, um, you might say that there's other statements that the difference between Krishna and Balaram is a difference only in their color. Krishna is compared to a transcendental rain cloud when you see the uh, sky during the monsoon season. The sky is blue, but in the front there are dark, dark clouds. But behind the dark clouds there's this blue, bluish color, which comes slightly through the clouds. And then we say, in order to get a slight understanding of a comparison of the color of the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna, this is explained in this way. Of course, no one can compare material uh, analogies with the color of the Supreme Lord, because his color is completely transcendental. But for the sake of us, we make some comparison to understand. Now, Valaram, he is called a white spring cloud. Sometimes you see the sky is full of beautiful white clouds. And you think, wow, look at that whiteness. It's the most white whiteness you could ever see. Because white is also different shades of white. So Balaram is that, you might even the scriptures even say, his whiteness is like crystal. So beautiful, at the same time, so sparkling white. So that's the only difference between Krishna and Balaram. Everything else is both by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So here is described. That original Lord Krishna appeared in Navadvip as Lord Chaitanya, and Lord Balaram appeared with him as Lord Nityananda. Prachendra Nandanaye, Sachi Sutta Kurgo Sai Balaram Hoyla Nitai. So Krishna is Prachendra Nandana, and then Lord Chaitanya is Prachendra Nandana, and Balaram is Nityananda. So sometimes people make a distinction between Nityananda and Balaram. And the scriptures give a really strong uh, reprimand for making such distinctions. It says that one who sees a difference between Lord Nityananda and Balaram is an atheist. <laughs> the word is Prashandi. And Prashandi is translated as atheist. So there are same person two forms. We can understand that. There's no difference, but they appear in two different forms of the same, of the self. 
So we can't expand ourselves. <laughs> we expand ourselves by having children, right? That's how long we expand. They look a little bit like us. <laughs> And then you think, there's my expansion. In fact, I have many expansions. So you know, like they, people like to have more and more children so they can expand on them. Okay. But that kind of expansion is not like the expansion of the Supreme Lord, where he manifests himself without any distinction within the original form. And is the, he is the same, but the form is totally different. And the form is different for function. They function a slightly little different, in order, in order to function slightly different, they manifest different forms like that. So you'll see, if you compare the activities of Balaram and the activities of Nityananda, Balaram's mercy to the conditioned souls, in some cases he would kill them. <laughs> that was his mercy. He was always fighting with demons, of course, that was part of his activities. But Nityananda, when Jagayamala attacked Nityananda, he simply didn't retaliate, but simply gave him them mercy and forgave them and blessed them and made them actually devotees by his mercy. So we might say that within the element of Nityananda, there's an extension of the mercy of the Lord. An extension of the mercy of the Lord, but they're the same person. It's just in that particular form, the mercy is more available. Like that. So that's the difference. So it says here, Lord Brahma is the original Sankarshana. He assumes five other forms to serve Lord Krishna. And we'll read about those five forms. He himself helps in the pastimes of Lord Krishna. And he does the work of creation and four other forms. He executes the orders of Lord Krishna in the work of creation. In the form of Lord Shesh, he serves Krishna in various ways. Okay, so I'll read this purport. This is Chaitanya, no, Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Lila, chapter 5, verse number 10. According to expert opinion, Balaram, as the chief of the original quadruple forms, is the original Sankarshana. According to expert opinion, Balaram, as the chief of the original quadruple forms, is also the original Sankarsha. Balaram, the first expansion of Krishna, expands himself in five forms. Maha Sankarsana, Karanam Di Daishi Vishnu, Garbhadaksai Vishnu, Shiradaksai, and Shesha. These five plenary portions are responsible for both the spiritual and material cosmic manifestations. Wow. So everything is there in those five forms. The spirit, so Balaram expands himself as all the Vaikuntha planets. He expands himself as all the manifestations within the spiritual world. So we might say the spiritual world is a manifestation of the energy of Balaram. And that way he assists the Lord in the work of, what we say, expansion of the spiritual world. Now when we say expansion, there appears to be something that happens at a particular time. But the spiritual world, Balaram, Krishna, and everything in the spiritual world is eternal. So when you think of expansion, you think that something is happening at a particular point in existence. But then again, everything is eternal. So how do you understand that? You don't. You can't understand it. You can only accept it as being the nature of the absolute truth. And you do get the understanding when you become, what we say, purified from all material, uh, material desires, material activities. When you reach perfection, 
the Lord reveals the truth about himself to you directly within your own heart. So we accept it now philosophically, but it's available in realization when we purify our existence more and more like that. So everything is there in Balaram. In these five forms, Balaram exists, assists Lord Krishna in his activities. The first four of these forms are responsible for the cosmic manifestations, whereas Shesha is responsible for personal service to the Lord. Shesha is also called Ananta, or unlimited, because he assists the personality of Godhead in his unlimited expansions by performing an unlimited variety of services. Sri Balaram is the servant of Godhead who serves Lord Krishna in all affairs of existence and knowledge. How active is Balaram? Lord Nityananda Prabhu, who is the same servant of Godhead Balaram, performs the same service to Lord Garanga by constant association. So both of them do the same work, they assist. Balaram is assisting Krishna. Vikinanda is assisting Garanga in their vilas and in, in the work of manifestation of the spiritual world. Now, it's also interesting, we know that there are five ways to connect with the Supreme. And these ways are called rasas. <coughs> Rasa means a type of, the word in English is translated as mellow. Now, that doesn't help much. But mellow, in a more, when we say exact, you might say mood. Like, mood is like, what is the mood of connection? So there are five rasas. Neutrality, servitorship, friendship, parental affection, and conjugal love. And each one of them are divided into many categories. But Balaram appears in service to Krishna in all five of these categories. It's interesting. Just like you see the RT paraphernalia when the deity is being worshipped with the ghee layer, all that RT paraphernalia is not different than Balaram. That's why we don't put it on the floor, we don't you know, touch it in the contaminated with contaminant, because it's actually the Lord in the form of paraphernalia. The Madonna, Sometimes we say the Balaram Madanga. Madanga is an, a, an expansion of Lord Balaram to assist, more like Lord Nityananda, to assist Garanga in his pastimes of Sankirtan. So we worship the Madanga as being uh, non different than Nityananda Balaram. And there's actually verses in the scriptures that glorify the Madanga in, in that context. Uh, the jewelry of the Lord is also Balaram. Those who do pujari work know that sometimes the deity is taken out of the altar and put on the bed. And the bed is considered to be Balaram. The shoes of the Lord are considered to be the Balaram. The umbrella of the Lord is considered to be non-different than Balaram. So in the rasa of neutrality, Balaram is served by assisting the Lord in the form of transcendental paraphernalia. In servitorship, he serves in different ways. In friendship, he becomes for Krishna's friend in Vrindavan and plays with Krishna in various ways. In parental affection, he's Krishna's older brother. Another name for Balaram is? Who knows? Dauji. Dauji, yeah. means older brother. So he performs the work of being a, you know, he, like Mother Yasoda will tell Krishna, you have to come back at a certain time to eat. And if you don't, you know, Balaram's going to make you do it. So I'm going to tell, tell Balaram, Balaram, you make sure that Krishna comes back in time. So he has to watch Krishna. So Krishna follows mother or so. He's kind of like a big brother. And in, in Vedic culture, big brother is considered to be like a parent. 
looking for over you know, younger brother or younger sister like that. So in that role, he serves as a parent. And in Madhurya Ras, this is mentioned in different places, but not explained so much. He assists in the Madhurya Ras and becomes the younger sister of Radharani Narayana Sananda Manjari. So he serves the Lord in the five rasas in Sri Vrindavan Dao. So how much work does Balaram do? <laughs> and he is also known as the original spiritual master. It says that in order to take shelter of devotional service, one has to take shelter of Krishna's representative, the bona fide spiritual master, who is a representation of Balaram, Pandityananda. So the tattva of the guru is coming from the energy of Lord Balaram. So Lord Balaram is considered to be the supreme spiritual master who, is, who empowers all others to become spiritual master. It's got a lot of work. That's Balaram. Okay, so let's read a little bit about his appearance, since today is his appearance day. We know how Krishna appeared. Krishna will be appearing soon, in about a week. And this comes Balaram's elder, so he comes first. So Krishna is about to appear after Balaram. So it says here, we know the story of how Kamsa was, he heard this omen in the sky that you know, the, the eighth son of your sister Devaki will be the cause of your destruction. So it says here, and of course Vasudev, the husband of Devaki, promised Kamsa that he would deliver the babies one after another in order to save Devaki from being killed by Kamsa at that time. He used a little transcendental strategy. When you deal with demons, you have to cheat them also, because they're cheaters. <laughs> Papa said, when you deal with a cheat, you also have to cheat. Sometimes. <laughs> so Vasudev, using transcendental intellect, convinced Kamsa not to kill his wife, or, you know, Devaki, and promised that he would deliver the sons. So, Kamsa killed one baby after another, six in a row. It says here, when, when Kamsa killed the six babies of Devaki and Vasudev one after another, many friends and relatives of Kamsa approached him and requested him to discontinue his heinous activities. But all of them became worshippers of Kamsa. When Devaki became present for, pregnant for the seventh time, a plenary expansion of Krishna known as Ananta appeared within her womb. So Ananta is Bhagavan. Devaki was overwhelmed both with jubilation and lamentation. She was joyful, for she could understand that Lord Vishnu had taken shelter within her womb. But at the same time, she was sorry that as soon as her child would come out, Krishna would kill him. Now this is interesting. This is motherly affection. God cannot be killed. She understood God has taken shelter in my womb, but yet she's afraid he's going to be killed. This is love. Her, her parental affection was more stronger than her philosophical understanding. When Mother Yasoda looked into the mouth of Lord Krishna after Krishna ate dirt, she saw, by Krishna's arrangements, all the universes and all the planetaries, everything, in the mouth of her own little baby son. And not only that, she saw herself looking into the mouth of Krishna in the mouth of Krishna. And she became overwhelmed. She thought, my son is God. And then Krishna said, I don't like this. This is ruining my relationship with her motherly love. So he made her forget. 
And then she was, again, chastising him for eating duck. <laughs> so that's love. <laughs> so Devaki is experiencing the same thing. She simply has this love for the Lord, but at the same time she's afraid he's going to be killed. This yoga maya is the principal potency of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In the Vedas, it is stated that the Lord, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, has multi-potencies. Parasya Saktir, the Vahaya Suyate. All the different potencies are acting externally and internally, and Yoga Maya is the chief of all potency. Krishna ordered the appearance of Yoga Maya in the land of Rajabhumi, Vrindavan, which is always decorated and full of beautiful cows. In Vrindavan, one of the wives of Vasudev was residing at the house of King Nanda and Queen Yasoda. Not only Rohini, but many other Vyadu dynasties were scattered all over the country due to the fear of the atrocities of Kamsa. Some of them were even living in the caves and in the mountains. So Kamsa's fearful declaration had caused many of the devotees to scatter and hide in different places. And one of Vasudev's other wives was Rohini, and she took shelter of Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yasori in Vrindavan, and she stayed there. Now, what are, another name of Balaram is what? Rohini Nandana, right? He's the beloved son of Rohini, or one who gives pleasure to Rohini, Rohini Sutta. Like that. So, the Lord told Yoga Maya, to enter into the womb of Devaki. And when she entered in, when that potency entered into the womb of Devaki, Devaki thought she had a miscarriage. Now Kamsa, Kamsa was seeing such effulgence coming from Devaki, and he was thinking, it says the seventh child, this is the it says the eighth child, this is only the seventh child. So he was thinking like that. And Devi, Devaki was like brilliant, like a glowing fire. So he became really fearful. But then, you know, Krishna wanted to protect Balaram. So he sent Yogamaya there, and Devaki seemed to have a miscarriage. In the middle of the night, she woke up and she felt she had lost her child. So of course, that's, that's a calamity. But that was Krishna's arrangement. And that same child was transferred to the womb of Rohini. And Rohini felt pregnant. <laughs> now you might think, how is that possible? <laughs> we know the system. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> but that's the way we do it. <laughs> God doesn't do it the same way. He is all-powerful. And this is something important to understand. Before we can understand the nature of God, part of understanding his nature is understanding that there is nothing that he cannot do. Someone asked Prabhupada a trick question one day. You know, sometimes Prabhupada would get these questions. And the question was, Prabhupada was talking about how great God is, that he can do anything. So the question was, if God is all-powerful, can he create a rock he can't lift? Definitely a trick question. Now, if you say yes, that means you limit his creating potency. And if you say no, that limits his lifting potency. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, yes, he can create a rock he can't lift, and then he'll lift it. <laughs> They don't create the potency to lift it. <laughs> so that ended that discussion. So the point is that God is all powerful. Bhakti Tarun Maharaj tells this one little antidote that he had was Prabhupada. That Prabhupada showed him a tamarind fruit. And in the tamarind fruit, there were so many tamarind seeds. And Prabhupada was saying, see this fruit, it's full of tamarind seeds. And each one of these seeds, there's another tree in that seed. 
And that tree can produce so many more fruits, which produce so many more seeds, which can produce so many more trees. So we get a little understanding of the intricacy and the power of God. He's so powerful. But that's nothing. You can do that really easily. So he easily took the child from the womb of Devaki and transferred it by the yoga mind pose. Now it describes that Yogamaya was thinking. Now Yogamaya is subordinate to Balaram. And she was thinking, wow, what a service I have. This is tough. I have to move the Supreme Personality of God in from one place to another. Now, it was like, have you ever given a service you think it's really, you can't do, and it looks really impossible? She was feeling like that. But then again, Krishna said, don't worry, I'll empower you to do this service. And she took shelter of Krishna's words and carried out. And then Balaram was born. And sometimes Balaram is seen as the son of Yasoda also. He's also called Yasoda Nandana. And Krishna is Yasoda Nandana. But Balaram also, because they grew up together as brothers in Vrindavan, both are seen as the son of Yasoda. That's why they're brothers. But Two different mothers like that. Okay, so, and that way Balaram was saved from the hands of Kamsa, like that. Of course, the Lord can't be killed, but in order to somehow or other show his transcendental potency in his nature, he acts in the most mysterious way. If we can figure out God, we'd be as good as God. Many people in the material world, they want to place their own understanding of what is God. And they explain it in different ways. They write books about what is God, what God does, what's He like. But it says that the mind, the intelligence, and even the imagination can't reach to the nature of the absolute truth. You can, your imagination can go to any realms of what we say, unlimitedness. I mean, you can think and imagine so many things. Even that falls short of the nature of God. God is so great. So no one can understand God, but God can be understood by Bhakti. So when we serve the Lord, by serving the Lord's representative, then the Lord reveals himself through that service like that. Now, when Krishna and Balaram were in Vrindavan, they grew up and they played games together. There were so many wonderful pastimes. The story of Balaram performing pastimes with Krishna and Sri Vrindavan Dham is unlimited. There's so many wonderful pastimes. But two were very, very, what we say, important for our own spiritual understanding. In order to get Krishna to eat, because, you know, little boys, I'm sure many of you are, are parents and you have little children. They like to play more than they like to eat, right? That's the nature of children. They like to play. And Krishna was the same way. He would play so much that they would play right through lunchtime and they would just keep playing, playing, playing. So in order to get Krishna to eat, Yogamaya arranged for a demon to come. And then Krishna would kill the demons, and then they would be tired after killing, and then they'd be hungry. And then it'd be time to have some prasad. <laughs> so that's how Krishna got him. That's how Krishna was able to eat. Because Yogamaya, seeing that Krishna was should eat, Madhya Soda was always concerned that Krishna was not eating. He's always playing. That's all he wants to do is play, play, play. When Lord Balaram came and performed that pastime of stealing the cowherd boys and calves, and then he was exposed to Krishna's power. He apologized to Krishna, and he offered nice prayers. And Krishna was just standing there waiting for the prayers to get over so he could go back to play with his friends. Yeah. He was thinking, when is this demigod going to get through? I really want to go back and play with my friends. <laughs> So this is the spiritual world. We play in this material world, but it's not the same. 
our flight usually ends up in some kind of disappointment, disaster, or even if it's nice, it ends. But in the spiritual world, you can play with Krishna as a friend. You can serve Krishna in different ways. You can become Krishna's parent, or you can also develop conjugal relationship with Krishna. These are available because by nature the soul has a particular internal loving relationship with Krishna. And through the process of bhakti, that relationship comes out. So one day, some of the cowherd friends of Krishna came to Krishna and said, you know, there's a nice forest, and it's got a lot of nice fruits, but you know, the problem is, there's one demon there, his name is Danuk, and he's in the form of an ass, and him and his ass friends are taking over the forest, and we want those fruits. They're so nice, they're the best fruits in the whole area. So Krishna, let's do something. But Krishna wanted to satisfy his friends, so they went along with Balaram. And Balaram came, and he saw the beautiful, tall fruit trees. And so they start shaking the trees, and all the fruits were Dum, 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 hitting the ground. And Danuk became really, really upset. So he came running out. Who's in my forest? Who's taking my fruits? This is my forest. So he saw, and Balaram was eating a fruit. And then just having a good time sharing with the counter boys. And then Danuk ran. He's an ass. You know what an ass is? I'm sure you do. <laughs> they call him, what does they call it? Kara, no, was it donkey? Yeah, donkey, Kara. So he ran and he kicked, boom, Balaram really hard in the chest, so hard. And Balaram just looked at him like, I'm busy eating fruits, don't bother me. <laughs> didn't, even, didn't even flinch. And then, ba and then they look and started to run again with full force. Again, he kicked Balaram. This time, Balaram grabbed his hind legs. And with one hand, eating the fruit with one hand, because he was enjoying the fruit. He didn't want to go with the semen. And he just went, and threw and hit the tree. And Daniel hit the tree, and hit one tree fell, and another tree fell, and another tree fell. And when Balaram was spinning him around, so fast that he lost his life just by the spin. The throw was just an extra thing. <laughs> so, and then all the other demons, which were different colored asses, they came running at Balaram. And Balaram and Krishna were having a fun grabbing the, the asses and just throwing them up in the tree. And it's described in the Krishna book that they were different colored asses. So, and they were landing in the trees, and they made a nice, beautiful, panoramic sight. Different color houses in the trees. <laughs> 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 so, so, the, so you might think, wow, this is killing. We're non-violent. But when God kills, he benedicts the person. Because Krishna says in Gita, Yeyatam mam prapadyante tamstataiva pachami aham mamavart manuvartate Manusha Partha Sarvashaha. He says, as you approach me, I reciprocate. So whatever way you approach God, he's going to reciprocate in that way. So if we approach him with, with, my dear Lord, give me something material, you may get something material, but you won't get God. You may get something. Sometimes he doesn't give it. And if you approach God for in love, then he reciprocates in a loving way. So the demons approach God in anger. They don't like God. They want to destroy God. They want to use God's property for their own selfish interests. And therefore, God, in a loving way, reciprocates by killing them and then they get the version. So that's Krishna. That's Krishna. So, now, Denukasura, he represents, what's an ass? An ass is an animal that works so hard for grass. 
Right? You see, in India, they put the heavy loads on the ass, and the washerman or whoever is putting a little grass in the front of the donkey's face. <coughs> and the donkey's thinking, oh, Prashad. And so he's walking like that. And the grass is moving, and the donkey's moving. That way the washerman gets his load carried. He's foolish, because he, if he just looks down, there's grass on the ground. But because he's a donkey, he's, he's not very intelligent. He thinks I have to work hard for grass. That's called ass mentality. <laughs> and therefore, in spiritual life, there's a thing called working hard for things you don't have to work hard for. In other words, they're called fruit of activities. Food is available everywhere, but people think I have to go work hard in order to get my food. But if we say Krishna, Krishna provides everything. So the principle of fruit of activities is the principle of working to enjoy the fruits of that activity, the ass mentality. Well, therefore, Balaram comes and kills the desire for fruit of activities. This is the meaning of this pastime. Both these leelas are <coughs> analogous to a spiritual principle, and at the same time, factual pastimes of the Lord. They're not just analogies, but they're both. Because the Lord, whatever the Lord does, He also teaches important transcendental spiritual knowledge to us. So you see, the common person in this work, world works so hard so they can enjoy the fruits of their activities. And therefore, these fruits belong to God because everything is the property of God. So Balaram kills that desire for fruit of activity. So when we serve the Lord in devotional service by serving the Lord's representative, the spiritual master, we destroy the desire for fruit of activity. Because fruit of activity causes distress. To work or to act in order to gain something material is the cause of all material unhappiness. Because the property of the Lord is given to us in order to use in the service of the Lord. And of course, we're allowed to take our quota. Everyone's allowed to live according to their quota. But everything belongs to the Lord, even our quota that we use for ourselves. So devotional service means to take the property of the Lord, use it in the service of the Lord, and enjoy the fruits of that activity, which is devotional service. And Krishna takes care of his devotee. Krishna takes care of his devotee. There's never any want in the life of a devotee when the devotee serves Krishna with faith. Krishna always takes care of his devotee. In any aspect. Should I tell a nice story? Yes. You sure? Yes. I'm not sure you'll like this story. <laughs> Maybe you won't like it. Anyway, I'll tell it. The story is that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came up to Srivas Thakur and said, Hey Srivas, you know? Srivas has a he's a great hasta, he has a big family, joint family. His four brothers and they lived together along with their wives and family. Now, Lord Satan said, Hey, Srivas, you know, you don't have any occupation. You don't do any work. How do you live? How do you eat? Srivas answered in the most unusual way. He went, <laughs> That was his answer. Now, Lord Satan didn't understand the answer. So he said, Srivas, can you explain what does that mean? Srivas said, hmm, well, one day if the Lord doesn't feed me, two days if he doesn't feed me and my family, three days if he neglects us, then I jump into the Ganges and drown myself. When Lord Chaitanya heard that, he roared so loud it shook the universe. And he was roaring in happiness. And he said, My dear Srivas, even if Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune herself, 
goes out with a begging bowl from door to door begging. Now, that's Lakshmi. She doesn't beg. If she does, even though be Krishna will always take provide for you because you have such faith. Now, don't quit your job now. That's not the problem. That's not the problem. But if you want to, if you want to, you won't lose anything. I can guarantee that. The only problem is you have to have the faith of Srivas. <laughs> Without that faith, it doesn't work. <laughs> it's faith that carries us through in devotional life and in any aspect of life. <coughs> so, in, in overcoming material, we, the common materialists work so hard for the basic things which are available just by God's arrangement. Prabhupada would say the elephant, he eats 40 kgs a day. And who's, how much work does he do? He's not working hard, but it's provided. And the ant, when the ant wants sh sugar, if there's sugar around, all of a sudden he gets the sugar signal, e -e -e, it's over here. Prabhupada said if you take a grain of sugar and put it on top of a big building, and there's ants nearby, they'll find it. That's God. God is in the heart of all living beings, taking care of each and every living being according to their needs. And then, of course, Dainapasura also means the useless knowledge that people accumulate in this world, which is another burden. People study all kinds of sciences and all kinds of, read all kinds of books. But it, has no more, it just makes them more and more confused about life. So the big burden of useless knowledge, the ass, working hard for nothing. So the spiritual master, who is the representative of Balaram, he comes and destroys that mentality and gives his body. <coughs> now there's another demon, it's called Palamba. You heard of Palamba, sir? Can we put the lights on? Light. Is this one? There you go. Oh, I can see you all. Now you can't hide. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's not the point. Palumbusura. He was a demon. But what he did, he wanted to kill Krishna. So he came in disguise as a coward boy. And Krishna and Balaram were playing different games, and Balaram was on one side, and Krishna was on the other side. And the losers had to carry the winners on their back. So Balaram, so Palumbasur played on Krishna's side, and Krishna's side won, and Balaram's side lost. No, Balaram's side won, I'm sorry. Balaram's side won, and Krishna's side lost. So, Palambasura had to carry Balaram on his back as a way to you know, honor the winner. So, this big, he's a cowherd boy, but he's in the disguise of a demon. He's a demon, but he's in the disguise of a cowherd boy. So, he's carrying, and then he's carrying far away. And all of a sudden, Balaram was thinking, where's this cowherd boy going? And then, all of a sudden, the demon turns into a demon. And now he's got this big, huge black form with copper eyes, and he's a monster. And Balaram gets a little bewildered, and Krishna says, Hey, Balaram, don't get bewildered, kill him. Balaram goes, <laughs> punched him in the head. And then it says that a river of blood flowed from his head, just like manganese oxide. That was the analogy which is kind of red in color, I think. Like Jai Balaram. What are these like when, when demons are killed, right? Yeah. <laughs> and killing demons, it's... Yeah, yeah because when demons get killed, everybody rejoices. Because demons get the mercy. I get killed. <laughs> That's how you give a demon mercy. Of course, we shouldn't kill demons. In, in, in the Gordon Thai Leela, which is the present Leela, how does the demons get killed? 
by attracting them to chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> Somehow or other, sometimes we go out on the streets and the drunks jump, and jump into the kirtan, right? Hey, hey, these guys are pretty cool, man. What are you guys singing? We don't know, but it's nice. And they jump up and down. We were just in Harinam in Zagreb, in Croatia the other night. And it was a hundred devotees, more than a hundred devotees on the Harinam. A mass Harinam. And we were going to different places in the city. And at the end, the kirtan really, really, really got powerful. And then all of a sudden, all these punks, you know, kids with, I don't know, they're dressed in different color hair, shade, different ways. Clothes are like, you know, some kind of rainbow or something. And they just started running towards our kirtan, and they just jumped in and started popping up and down. And they looked, they were actually dancing better than the devotees. <laughs> they made the devotees look like old men. <laughs> just jumping up and down, and just singing, having a good time. And they don't know what they're doing. They think we're having a party out there. <laughs> we are. We have a transcendental party. But they're enjoying it. So then in this age, this is how we spread the mercy. By through the holy name and through Krishna Prashad. These two things are really essential in changing the demoniac mentality of the people of this age. Because sometimes people come up to me and say, Maharaj, I'm trying to preach to my mother. She doesn't like anything. I try to tell her Chin Hare Krishna. She just looks at me like funny, like why are you doing all that crazy stuff? And she won't read the books. I'll give a little prashant pretty soon. You know, gradually the heart becomes, what we say, peaceful. The mind becomes peaceful. So this is the, in this age, this is how the demons are destroyed. The prashant and the haya. And in this age, Prabhupada said, there's more demons in this age than ever, and therefore if you have to kill the demons, you have to kill everybody. Because <laughs> everybody has a demonic mentality in this age. Pretty much. So, but in this age, therefore, uh, Lord Nityananda, Lord Chaitanya, who's Balaram himself, come again to spread the glories of the Holy Name by distributing his mercy in the form of the Holy Name and Krishna Prasad, like that. Powerful forces. So, Palamasura, he represents cheating and deception. The cheating mentality. What is the cheating mentality? Presenting oneself as something you're not. He's a demon, but he's presenting himself as a god. People in this age, they have so many faults, but they want to hide their faults and present themselves as being very learned, very beautiful, just like sometimes, this is not a criticism, you know, Women go for in the front of the mirror and for like an hour they kind of like, you know, do this puja, putting all this stuff in their face. And they come out and they, they look a lot different. You know, and, you, and you see it before and after, you think, well, it's the same person. <laughs> so, you know, it's like you, know, you put on a new face for the public. But really, the body is the body. It's what it is. The soul is actually beautiful. So a person becomes beautiful, attractive, learned, and qualified in so many ways when they engage in devotional service, and not simply by adjusting the material body you know, arrangements. So that's real attraction. And the soul is the real person. So the material life, people are presenting themselves in the soul, and that's deception. Therefore, to get over this bodily conception of life, one has to take shelter of Balaram, who is the spiritual master who teaches us what is real lucky or what is it, what is our real identity. We sing in the prayers in the morning to the spiritual master. What is that? Dibya Gyan Ride Prakrasito. What is the line before that? Taku Jam Dido Ye Janbi Jambi Prabhupada would say, Pita say, Prabhu say, Dipigyan Rude Prakrasita. 
my spiritual master, he opened my eyes with spiritual knowledge. He is my Lord in every birth. And what is he given? Dibgyan. So the word is dibgyan. What is that dibgyan? Dib means transcendental, gyan means knowledge. What is that dibgyan? You are Krishna's servant. That's all. Eternal. That's your only identity. All other identities are temporary and subject to time. No. So whatever identity we have will change. We may be a man in this life, the next life a woman. Prabhupada said sometimes a big president will act like a dog and then the next life he's a dog. Same soul in a different body. So the body is all, all temporary and always changing. But who are we? We are Krishna's servant eternally. That's all. That's our identity. Our only identity. So that's, that mercy is given by the spiritual master. And when we realize that, we have understood what is real happiness. Because real happiness is on the spiritual platform. So the material world is, is called a perverted reflection of the reality. If you look into the mirror, you see what's held in front of the mirror. But what's in, what's in the mirror is simply a reflection of the object. If you're eating bananas in front of the mirror, the person in the mirror is not eating the bananas. <laughs> it looks like it. So this world is a reflection of the reality. The reality is the spiritual world. And therefore, similar activities go on here because they started there. But the only problem here is they're temporary and full of misery. Whereas there, they're perfect. So forever, for looking for the perfect relationship, the perfect happiness, we can find it in Krishna or in Balaram, in the spiritual in spiritual relationships. And when we find it through bhakti, devotional service, with Krishna or his representative, then we find it everywhere. Because this material world is also the energy of Krishna. So, everything starts with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Like that. So, question. Who's stronger, Krishna or Balaram? And Prabhupada would say, now, he asked that question. Did Prabhupada ask this question? And, say, and he was in the Krishna Balaram temple in Vrindavan. And he said, just look at the deities and you can get your answer. So who's leaning on who? Balaram's leaning on Krishna. So who's stronger? Krishna. Krishna. <laughs> Transcendental antidote. This is nice. So, these are some of the activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Balaram had two wives. One was Kalindi and one was Revati. Kalindi, we know how uh, Kalindi was. Balaram was in Vrindavan. He came to perform his activities with his gopis in Vrindavan. There's a time of the year called Balaram Rasalila. That's in the beginning of, in the middle of April, in the month of, what is it? Uh, what is that month? Bausch? No. In April? Month of April. Very auspicious month. Month of Vishaka, I think. So in that time, Balaram went to Vrindavan and performed activities like Krishna does with Rasalila. But he has his own set of gopis. So Balaram got a little intoxicated. He likes to drink, what is it called? Baruni. What is Baruni? It's, you shouldn't drink it. You might get some tonight. <laughs> I say somebody's making it. Watch out. But it's liquor honey, or honey liquor. It's honey that comes in the form of a liquor, like that. So Balaram got intoxicated on that. And then he wanted to take bath in the Jamuna. And he, so he called Jamuna to come, and he wanted to take bath in the waters. 
But she saw him and saw he was a little intoxicated, not recognizing his real identity. She didn't come. So Balaram became upset. He sees not coming. So he took, he's got two weapons, or two associates. One is called the plow, and the other one is what you got hit on the head with tonight. <laughs> was it the club, right? Haladar. Haladar is the club, is the plow, and Sunanda is the club. He has names. The personalities, they assist Lord Bala. So he took Haladar and took Jamuna and started to bifurcate her into different streams. So even today you see that Jamuna is not one river, it's broken up into smaller streams. But then when she saw that, she became frightened and she realized, oh, this is the Supreme Personality. So she came out of the water in a transcendental form as Jamuna and she surrendered to Balaram. It's a beautiful picture of that. You see her offering a lot of wonderful prayers to Lord Balaram. And in order to please Lord Balaram, she submitted herself. And he accepted her as his transcendental consort. She is also known as Kalundi, or Jamuna. She's the, she's the daughter of the sun god, and also the brother of Yamaraj. Yamaraj is her brother, like that. So, Balaram married Kalindi, but then he will, the story of getting married to Revati was it's really interesting. Would you like to hear that story? Yes. You sure? Are everybody hungry? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're all hungry. I think there's a really nice feast. <laughs> but I'll tell you a secret. Should I tell you a secret? The more you get involved with the pastimes, the better the feast tastes. <laughs> it's true. First we have to eat the philosophy. <coughs> and then we can eat the, the prasad. Because it stimulates everything. So, Ray, there was a king called Rebata. And he had a very, very, very qualified daughter. Her name was Rebati. So, he looked all over the earth and couldn't find a husband for his daughter. She was just too qualified. So he decided, let me go to Lord Brahma, and I'll ask Brahma if he could arrange for some marriage, maybe for some great deva in that heavenly planets. So he arrived, he was able to go by his own power, along with his daughter, to Brahma Loka. But Brahma was busy, and he was engaged in some musical performance. And so he had to wait a few moments, and then Brahma came out. And then he presented, I have this beautiful daughter, can you arrange someone? Is there someone on earth that you can recommend? He said, on earth, you can recommend. Brahma said, you know, you've been here for a few months, a few minutes, but actually it's 27 Divya Yugas that are already passed on earth. So all the candidates are all gone. <laughs> the whole scene has changed. But I can tell you what you can do. You can go and offer your daughter to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Balaram. So he did, and Balaram accepted her. Now, she came from a different yuga. And when she came back down, everybody was like a little smaller. Because people in the big yugas, in the early years, they were tall. It says Arjuna was, Krishna was 14 feet tall when he came on the battle. Some of the soldiers were 20 feet tall. That's about, what, four meters, five meters tall. It's like a pretty, pretty big guy up there. <laughs> That's, you know, in this age, everybody goes, mm -hmm. oh, shrunk him down, right? All kind of little midgets running around. So, when Balaram was smaller than her, she was really tall. So he thought, this is not so good. <laughs> so he took his plow and he pulled her down. <laughs> so I don't know if you ever have that problem. <laughs> you could just ask Balaram if he could help you out. <laughs> Sometimes we see that problem. So anyway, but this is... And then Balaram accepted her. And if you go to the temple in Jagannath Puri, it's a beautiful deity of uh, 
uh, Gopinath. Uh, told to Gopinath. In that temple, on one of the altars, is a beautiful deity of Balaram along with Revati and Kalindi. You seen that deity? Anybody? And uh, in the Puri? Yeah, beautiful. So he married, and then of course, Lord Nityananda, when he appeared, he also accepted two wives. Should I tell you a little bit about the marriage of Lord Nityananda? I should speak a little bit about Nityananda, because he's also Balaram. So that was arranged. Uh, Sarakela, his last name was Sarakela. He had a beautiful daughter. He had two daughters. One was, uh, what was her name? Vishuddha and Janavi, Janava, Janava and Vishuddha. Vasudha. 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 And so they were sisters. And so, what was his name? Sorry, Kayla, I can't remember his first name. Anyway, he married, he wanted to marry Janava to Nityananda, and Nityananda accepted her. So during the wedding ceremony, before the wedding, there was a big, there was, this was a few days, there was a feast, and Visuda, or what's it about? Vasuda, Vasuda, V-A. She was serving, and she was serving Lord Nityananda, and she came around with something to offer. Now, when she came to Lord Nityananda, her veil fell down off her head. Now, she didn't want to stop her service to Lord Nityananda, so she manifested two other arms and fixed her veil. And then she kept serving her. And Lord Nityananda said, hmm, this is an interesting mataji. <laughs> So he married both of them. <laughs> so they had a joint wedding. <laughs> so they were both transcendental personalities who appeared in those forms in order to perform and assist Lord Nityananda's Leela like that. So Lord Nityananda is Balaram. There's another beautiful pastime. When Balaram was traveling, he came across a sacrifice by the sages of Nami Sharanya. And they had elected Lomaharshan Sutta to become the head of the sacrifice. And he was the presiding personality that would lead the sacrifice. When Balaram came into the assembly right after the inauguration of Lomaharshan Sutta, everyone saw him. And all the sages and everybody stood up in honor of Balaram, except Lomaharshan Sutta. He remained seated. He had just been given the position of honor amongst the sages. Balaram noted that. He took a piece of grass, which is called kusa grass. Have you ever seen kusa grass? It's sharp. <laughs> it's really sharp. And he twisted it and he touched Ramaharshan Sutta and killed him <laughs> right on the spot. And all the sages said, Oh no, Balaram, what did you do? You just killed our. CEO, you know, he was the main guy. And so Balaram says, well, if that's a problem, I can bring him back to life. And they said, no, 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 it's all right. We don't want you to do anything that you wouldn't want to do. So, you know, you're killing him is obviously perfect. So and then they say that the son is the embodiment or representative of the father. So his son was Sutta Goswami, and he took the position. So we hear from Bhagavatam, when Bhagavatam opens, it's Sutta Goswami who's speaking, who was the son of Omaharshan Sutta. But the thing was, there's a nice verse in that pastime that it's explained that Omaharshan Sutta, although he was elected as the head, his knowledge was like the knowledge of a dramatic actor when he performs a performance. You follow? In other words, his knowledge was philosophical, not internalized, not realized knowledge. 
He knew the knowledge simply by memorization. He didn't have a deep philosophical understanding of the knowledge. And therefore, Balaram, and by not honoring Balaram, he showed that he didn't know how to honor a saintly person, or even Krishna himself, God himself. So Balaram wanted to show that external knowledge is not real knowledge. Well, the knowledge has to become, what we say, part of oneself. That's why Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada says, come to our society, they become transformed. Transform means you become a different person. You become what the scriptures describe as a person who is a devotee of the Lord. So we transform our consciousness and develop transcendental qualities and transcendental knowledge like that. Okay, I have a feeling that many of you would like to... Tomorrow's a work day, right? Yeah. For some of you. So we shouldn't stay too long because we could speak for a while yet on Lord Balaram. There's a lot to say. But anyway, take shelter of Lord Balaram. Balaram represents spiritual strength. If we want to approach Krishna, we have to approach Krishna through Lord Balaram's mercy. And he, he is Rama. Rama means pleasure, and Bala means strength. He gives transcendental pleasure by using, by giving transcendental strength like that. So not, he gives us the strength to carry on in devotional service. That same Balaram is Nityananda. So in this age, we pray to Lord Nityananda, please be merciful, and engage me in the sanctity of the and chanting your holy. Thank you very much. Lord Balaram Ki Jai, Om Jayanti Ki Jai, Lord Vrindavan Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Om Namah Shivaya.